because they didn't have good pants. And I had a pair of suspenders and I had a shirt. I didn't even wear a coat at all. And that's fairly realistic because I was the battle I was reenacting was Palmito Ranch, which occurred in May in South Texas. So it was really, really hot. Yeah, that's better than further north, that jacket. That'd be rough going. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I'm looking at the next question. I really like this one. Um, oh, yeah. This is the one about the uh, correlation between edu- education and how good a general they were. Right. Because just yeah. about every single Love general it. was a graduate of West Point. It's, I mean, the the education is almost as incestuous as, I don't know, an investment banker or who all go to the Ivy League in, in some way, shape, or form. So almost everyone is a West Point candidate uh, or a graduate. Almost everyone uh, gets the same type of education. My drinking game was Napoleonic tactics because that was what was taught at the time. Uh, so is there any correlation from how well they graduated and how well they did in the war? We have good data, and I found a research paper that um, – took a listing, uh, some Civil War compendium that ranked Civil War generals based on battle tactics and bravery and other data points. They compared that to a um, listing that West Point does. Uh, what's it called? Uh, the GOM, the General Order of Merit. So West Point ranks its graduates. Mm-hmm. And this research paper graphed the correlation between them. So, um, And for James and I, both of us have taught at universities, so we might find that what we teach and the knowledge we impart could be completely useless <laughs> too. <laughs> well, I guess not. I mean, we're, we just do general history, but the direct lessons that were given at West point on how to be an effective commander, we're going to see if that has actually any bearing whatsoever. Um, so I want to reference two studies um, or what this study, but then a book. Uh, there's a wonderful little book called last in their class, the goats of West point Academy, uh, West point Academy. Um, and it looks at, uh, Custer, General Custer. Custer. Yeah. <laughs> he would. So there, there was a special honor. You were the goat. If you finished last in your class, uh, this was, you were celebrated. If you got this at West Point. um, you weren't thought of as being not intelligent enough for it, but being able to skate by and being able to, you know, not really care about authority. So anyway, um, the Civil War had uh, 359 generals who graduated from West Point. There's 217 for the Union, 142 for the Confederacy. Uh, so Custer and other goats of West Point thought that he had a spirit of adventure and he was more interested in going to local taverns than um, studying. Uh, so anyway, the author of this book, James Robbins, he noticed that some of the least distinguished cadets of West Point had the most remarkable military careers. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's not using longitudinal data or anything. He's just, you know, kind of, uh, kind of a general analysis, but here's what he said. Uh, I was at Gettysburg on a staff ride. We were on the little roundup and some guys were talking about Patrick O'Rourke, who was first in the class of June of 1861 and had died on little roundup defending the Hill. Then someone else talked about George Pickett, who was last in his class of 1846. He was a goat. And led Pickett's charge. And someone else mentioned Henry Heth or Henry Heath, who is Pickett's cousin. He was there and he was last in his class also. And George Custer was last in his class of 1861. So he began to wonder how many last in their class guys fought at Gettysburg. And it turns out there were six. There were three on each side. So um, his kind of theory of the correlation between class rank and career success is that there's folklore that it's always the people from the middle and below who make the best officers and leaders. Um, Sometimes you do have people who graduate at the top and have great careers. Like Robert E. Lee was second in his class and Douglas MacArthur did well. Um, But Dwight Eisenhower was middle of his class. And he said, if anyone saw great signs of greatness in me at West Point, they kept it to themselves. And um, (laughs) just, just great. Even during world war two, people didn't think much of him, but um uh, Ulysses S. Grant graduated in the middle of his class. Um, so he, here's part of the reason why it's not just we're not just relying on some conjecture that, well, the guys who make A's in college work for the guys who got C's. It's a little bit more specific than that. Um, in the 19th century, the commissions that you got were based on graduating class rank. Uh, so the way West Point was structured, there may have been some incentive for cadets to graduate at the bottom because where you went in the army was determined by where you graduated in West Point. 
if you were at the top, you might go into engineering or ordinance or something like that because those are technical skills. If you graduate near the bottom, um, you might go to in- infantry or cavalry. And that's the place where you go and find opportunities to fight and win glory. And uh, you can quickly rise up the ranks. I mean, look at Nathan Bedford Forrest, who goes from private to general. Don't think you could you could do that as a cavalryman. Don't think you could do that as an artillery officer. Um, so one now I want to just mention a, a couple of short things about the study. Uh, this is by Carl Robesnake, uh, Robesnake, can't really pronounce his last name. Yeah, um, it was published in 2012, um, and it's called Predicting Leadership, West Point Civil War Legacy. And so he first looked at West Point's uh, general order of merit. It's a formal composite ranking that includes academics, athletics, and um your your ranking was published for each graduate for 175 years. So um, and then he compared this ranking with a book by Michael Lee Lanning that ranked how good Civil War generals were based on different criteria that you would see in military history books on leadership, battle tactics, yada, yada, yada. Um, the upshot of his whole study, and you can read it if you want to, to dig into it, but Judging by individual generals' battlefield performance, there does not appear to be a relationship to their academy academic performance. So there you go. It doesn't. And he even he even charted the data points on um, what is their general order of merit ranking versus how well are they ranked as a general. And it looked like somebody just blindly threw darts at a dartboard. It seems that there's ab- there's not even a Gaussian distribution for you data nerds. It's <laughs> it seems completely randomized. There's just, yeah. it seems like there's almost no connection whatsoever. So I don't know. What do you make as an educator? What do you make of that, James? Are we, have we wasted our lives is what I'm getting down to. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it's one thing the, the, the military education that they had at West Point was very theoretical. It was very book oriented. Um, it wasn't all that practical. And so to me, that's not all that surprising. And I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised at all about the results of that study because if if somebody just asked me that in the hall and I had 30 seconds to give an answer, I'd pretty much say, yeah, there's no correlation. I mean, think about Robert E. Lee was second in his class and he was outstanding. But as you mentioned, Grant was in the middle of his class and Grant just really, some guys just weren't interested in the book learn book learning, as we say in the (laughs) South here. Uh, You know, uh, Grant liked to be outside. He liked to ride horses and, he liked math, but he just didn't care for a lot of the other military stuff. And, and hey, George B. McClellan, second yes. in his class. Okay. And he ought to be ranked, <laughs> I don't know about dead last on that survey, but pretty close to the bottom. So, yeah. He is exactly what I thought of when it came to buy the book and not in a positive way. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. He's, he was born and made to be a staff officer, you know, an administrative pencil pusher like Henry Halleck was, but uh, he didn't want to do that. He thought he was the the new Napoleon. Salute! Mm-hmm. <laughs> Here, cheers. <laughs> my, big, my big mug. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and even um, and I can see where they would come from because um, Napoleon and Frederick the Great they were also very um, they they studiously looked at Alexander the Great, Hannibal of Barca, Scipio Africanus, all these great military minds from throughout history, and applied them. And so for all the Napoleon wannabes, which is basically everyone at West Point, it seems, they might think, okay, if I do that same thing, then I can be this great leader. Hey, everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. Hey, everyone, want to take a short break in this episode on our narrative on the Civil War. I want to mention a way how you can help support this show. And you can do so by saving big with a great new product from a company called Candid. Candid basically takes all of the misery out of adult orthodontia. There's millions of people at any given time in the United States who have wire braces, and there are many, many millions more who should be wearing retainers and aren't and need a tooth straightening solution. Well, Candid is a company that makes it possible to get tooth straightening without ever having to visit an orthodontist, without ever having to leave your home, and to get it all done much more cheaply and in a fraction of the time of conventional orthodontia. The way it works is that Candid sends a modeling kit to your home so you can take impressions of your teeth. After you send back your impressions with some photos of your teeth, 
A network of orthodontists reviews your case and provides you with a 3D preview of what your treatment will look like. After you receive your 3D preview, it's up to you if you want to go forward or not with a tooth aligner treatment plan. And when you get your treatment plan, it results in straighter and brighter teeth in an average of six months and can cost thousands of dollars less than braces. And again, no office visits are needed. Everything is delivered to your home. You can take advantage of Candid's risk-free modeling kit guarantee. And when you use my dedicated link, candidcode.com slash unplugged, you'll save 25% off your modeling kit. That's candidcode.com slash unplugged to get 25% off the price of your modeling kit. Candidcode.com slash unplugged. Yeah, Yeah, we had one comment, Scott, if I can uh, butt in for a second. Uh, Christian Lewis. Hi, Christian. Glad you could make it. Um, Christian points out that professors make good generals, too. So there is hope for us, uh, Scott. Maybe that military glory is still in our future, although I'm a little too old now. But, of course, you know, there were Civil War generals older than me, so. I uh, think about Joshua Chamberlain, uh, the mm-hmm. the savior of Little Round Top on the second day of Gettysburg. He was a philosophy professor. That's right. Uh, Who was Benjamin, the, Episcopal- Sorry, uh, the Episcopal bishop was yes. Le- Leonidas Polk. Yeah, he probably Thank should you, have stayed yeah. in the church. Uh, <laughs> but and then there was Benjamin Grierson, who was the uh, Union cavalry commander that we talked about in the ex- in the uh, episode on Vicksburg. He was, was a music mm-hmm. teacher. So you know, and you think even like think about the Revolutionary War. You had some of the top commanders had no military experience whatsoever, like uh, Henry Knox. Henry Knox was a bookseller, but he turned into an outstanding uh, cavalry. I mean, I'm sorry, artillery commander. Uh, can you tell what I'm researching these days? Yeah, uh, and I'm from Knoxville, Iowa, so shout out to my man, Henry Knox. I'm, a, uh, I'm very well, pro-Knox in this camp. Well, is that where Fort Knox is? Or no, it's in Kentucky. Uh, right? Oh no, I'm I'm not. I'm from Knoxville, Iowa. So I am. Oh, the, the, oh okay, I am from okay. the number two Knoxville in America. Yeah, um, and, there's about and, eight or ten Knoxvilles. There's Knoxville, Illinois, yeah. Knoxville. Yeah, you name it, all over the place. Also Nathaniel Green. But anyway, this is not a Revolutionary yeah. War podcast. Although, so uh, spoiler alert, quiet. everyone, James and I are cooking up a Revolutionary War series similar to this one. So We're working on it. Be patient. Yeah. It takes a lot of Dust time. Dust off to... your tricorner hats, and um, I guess you can replace your Civil War um, Applejack whiskey with some rum, or if you're really fancy like Benjamin Franklin, some Madeira. But... Yeah. yeah. It's George Washington's favorite. Yeah. All right. Is it my turn? What's it next? is uh, POW camps in more detail. That was a question. Oh, I, I do want to add one thing about the civilian deaths. I, I, I found one source from the National Park Service. Um, of course, nobody knows exactly how many total civilians died in the Civil War, but it says here that uh, James McPherson, who's one of the top Civil War scholars, uh, alive right now in uh, the United States. He, he's estimated that there are about 50,000 civilian deaths. So that's quite a few. But again, as I mentioned, most of those are going to would have been from disease or starvation. Uh, and there were also random acts of violence. One of the uh, commenters mentioned Lawrence, Kansas. And I, I wasn't even really thinking about Kansas and Missouri earlier when I was talking about oh, Atlanta, Atlanta right. Vicksburg. But yeah, there was a yeah. brutal guerrilla war. Uh, some people would argue that the civil war actually started in Kansas in 1855 or 1857 uh, before it really got going in the East. So yeah, there were a lot of uh, acts of atrocity in Kansas and Missouri, really, really brutal guerrilla war. But anyway, let me get to the uh, prisoners of war. So one of the commenters, uh, I can't see his name now, for some reason, the comments keep disappearing but somebody mentioned they they couldn't understand the system of paroling and exchanging. So let me give a brief background on how prisoners were handled. Early in the war, they would either there were they didn't take prisoners and put them in camps. They tried to get rid of them as early as they could because you know you don't want to have a hundred, two hundred, a thousand guys that you've got to feed and take care of, and you have to guard them, make sure they don't run away. So they would do what's called paroling, and it's paroling means they sign an agreement. The prisoner signs a paper saying they will go home and they will not fight anymore, at least until they're exchanged. We'll talk about exchanging in a minute. And somebody, one of the commenters said, I can't believe anybody would do that. But I mean, you think about the horror of civil war combat. If I was given a free pass to go home, (laughs) heck yeah, man, I'll go home. Sure. I mean, I think only the most gung ho, 
you know, I'm going to die for my, the Southern cause, or I'm going to die for the Northern cause. Only those guys would be tempted to break it. I think most, um, most of that patriotic fervor 